God does answer prayers. Um, we've seen a lot of amazing things happen here at Lightbridge over the last 12 years with answered prayer. Um, we have a team of prayer warriors that sit in the back over there. And at the end of today's service, if you are hurting financially, if you're hurting relationally, if you're hurting spiritually, um, please go and, and ask for prayer. And God will, will speak to you through our prayer warriors. Um, and so... Um, when I finish here, the worship team will continue, but let's invite God here today to, in our presence. Heavenly Father, Lord, um, Lord, we praise and thank you so much for all that you do, all that you've done in our lives, what you are doing and what you will do, Lord. And Lord, um, as we look at today's sermon regarding the elephant in the room, these tough questions about Christianity, Lord, um, you wrote the book literally, <laughs> and it's a love letter to us, Lord. And there are mysteries in the Bible that we don't understand. And through your words and through Steve's message today, we just hope we're going to have a, a glimpse into who you are. You're all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving, um, Lord. And um, today we just ask that the Holy Spirit will open our eyes so that we can see you, Lord. That the Holy Spirit will open our ears, Lord, so we can hear you. And Lord... We ask that the Holy Spirit will open our mouths so we can sing and praise you, Lord. Amen. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and praise. Well, good morning, church. Great to see everybody here. I'm uh, quite excited about sharing with you some of the things that I believe that God has laid on my heart to share with you about in regards to this whole idea of the elephants in the room and some of the... Uh, arguments that we may hear and uh, some of the uh, opportunities that we have to um, be able to have an answer to everyone who, gives a, uh, who asks us of the reason of the hope they have within us. Now, we have heard it said, most of us, if not all of us, have heard it said at some point that we don't talk about politics, we certainly don't talk about religion, if we want to keep peace among family, friends, co-workers. Those are some of the things that you're supposed to just leave at the door when you come into the home. The problem, however, is that inevitably, both of those topics uh, do keep coming up because they're both quite simply unescapable facts of life, certainly in our culture and the world we live in. Life and death, certainly facts of life and death when it comes to the matter of religion. Now, certainly in the case of Christianity, the promise to keep the peace through silence, I think sometimes creates more angst by introducing the elephant in the room scenario as, as uh, Cliff had mentioned. Questions, uh, challenges, nobody's willing to voice and along with that answers that no one is willing to offer or not sure if they can present it. In order to keep the peace, however, I'm going to suggest that we do identify the elephant in the room. Long term, I think that actually does help. So then, because it gives opportunity to process, opportunity to discuss. And we need to be a place, when we talk about discussing the elephant in the room, we also need to understand that when we do talk about the elephant in the room, whatever situation, whether it's in a church gathering together, whether it's in your home, whether it's in your office place, or wherever it is that you're going to be talking about whatever the elephant in the room is, that there needs, it needs to be a safe place. And you need to learn to listen. You need to learn to allow people to share their thoughts. Now, the Apostle Peter gave us some great advice. He advised us or challenged us in 1 Peter to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that is in you. That is really what we would call apologetics. It's a defense of our faith given in answer to what we believe. Now, apologetics boils down to knowing what we believe, why we believe it, and being able to communicate then that uh, belief that we have in an effective and in winsome manner to those who do question our faith and come to us and ask us why. But I also believe that if you're going to have an opinion, you better have a clue. And too often, I know I've been guilty of this, where I've had opinions and I've had no clue. And it's, uh, that's not a healthy place to be and position to put yourself into. So in this, in this series, we're going to attempt just that. We're collectively getting a clue so that we can be prepared to answer anyone who asks us of the hope that we have within us, as Peter says. So over the series, this next six weeks, the questions that we're going to attempt to answer are, do all religions lead to God, which is what we're going to look at today. We're also going to be looking at the, uh, what's the problem with hell, 
Doesn't science prove there is no God? If God is so good, why does he allow suffering? Why would I believe Jesus is God? And then the last one, isn't the Bible full of contradictions? So each one is really building on the other. And you really need to experience them all to be able to uh, process through all of this Elephant in the Room series. So if you happen to miss one, we will have it on video. And uh, you can come back to our church website and catch up on the ones you did miss. But yeah, preferably if you're together here, there's something about gathering together. In fact, while you're here, I just want to draw your attention to the bulletin. On the back side of the bulletin, there's also some uh, notes that you can follow along. So if you missed a certain point, at least it's on there for you. And uh, as well as I have some questions, whether you're meeting in a life group or maybe it's something that you want to discuss in your homes later around the table, the supper table, there's some questions down at the bottom that you can process through as well. So we're going to look at those six questions. And in doing so, what we hope to accomplish is three things. We hope to strengthen our faith in Jesus Christ, one. We hope to introduce the living God to those who may not yet know him. And thirdly, we, uh, we hope to help prepare ourselves to to be able to do the very thing that Peter has instructed us to do. So before we launch into Do All Religions Lead to God, let's just open in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for your word that you have provided for us so that we have answers, so that we're not left out hanging in the wind, that we can explore what your word says, we can listen to what your Holy Spirit speaks to us about, and Father, that we can live out a life that has the answers really ultimately in Jesus. So, Father, lead us this morning, and I pray that you be revealed and that your glory come down in this place, and you receive all that is due you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I don't know if any of you have done this before. I've done this. But you go out into our big, bad, scary world, and you ask the question, what is your biggest problem with Christianity? Maybe you've asked that in a heated argument, but maybe ask that in an argument or in a situation where it's not an argument, but you're just asking a friend. Possibly, I've done this even on the street where I've asked somebody on the street in the middle of, yeah, in the, just almost kind of in a weird way maybe they, they thought, but I asked, what do you think about Christianity or what's your biggest problem with Christianity? The answer that comes back is usually, uh, many, many words, but can be summed up usually into one word, exclusivity. Even the mere hint of our exclusive claims causes most Canadians to cringe and to shudder. The thought to many is that we are, maybe you've heard these words, we're intolerant, narrow-minded, arrogant, hateful, even that B word, you're bigoted. On the surface, the popular philosophy of the day that we're living in seems driven by a broad-minded concern for harmony and tolerance. That's what it seems to be, and so we're viewed as opposite of that. And that all sounds so charitable and altruistic, but what really underlines this belief system is, and some of you may have discovered this already, is an utter intolerance for every worldview that makes any universal truth claims. In fact, in our westernized culture, exclusive worldviews such as Christianity are actually now being seen as an issue that is a danger to cultural harmony. I don't know if you know Bill Nye, the science guy. He has actually come out to say that any child raised in a home that teaches creation is tantamount to child abuse. And there are many people who believe those kinds of things. That, that if you have a narrow-minded view of God as, as uh, conservative Christianity teaches, that that is dangerous to a family uh, unit. And that has actually come out publicly in, in the news uh, media, not just Bill Nye the science guy, but within even our governments as well. To help us understand the thought processes though in our culture, and I think we need to understand that to be able to address some of these issues, it doesn't just help to give the old Sunday school answer. Well, you know, uh, I have a problem with Christianity because uh, you teach creationism, uh, that's going to, uh, uh, that's dangerous to your children. Well, Jesus. You know, that's not going to be the answer. That doesn't help the situation. They'll look at you funny. So I think we need to understand the thought processes in the culture, and we need to be able to address some of the concerns being raised. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you a few, only four, uh, ideas and or questions brought up by the average skeptic regarding the exclusive claims that are made by conservative Christianity, and I would argue they're made by the Word of God itself. 
There's a lot more questions that we could cover, but for the sake of time, I'm only going to cover more, more, four main thoughts, which I think kind of encompass a lot of them anyways, that give you a general idea. So we'll cover those four, and you'll see those listed on the back of your bulletin. Then following that, I'm going to come back to what Jesus' thoughts were on the matter. And then I'm going to finally speak to how we as modern day Christians need to prepare ourselves, as Peter instructed, in light of the cultural pushback that we find ourselves in. Does, is that okay? You think that'll work? Excellent. So the first one we're going to look at is the, culture, uh, the cultural arguments then that are presented. The first one that comes across as all religions or religions intolerance just simply causes conflict. You may have heard that before. All of the worries in the past have been a result of religious fervor and problems. I've heard that argument too before. By the way, that's not true. Um, just look at communism, you look at other uh, Nazism, you look at other, uh, there's political reasons, there's all those other kinds of reasons. But there's this concern that's put out there, and that claims that we will never come to know peace on earth if religious leaders keep on making such exclusive claims about Jesus being the only way. So what do you do with that? Well, here's my first thought on that matter. They're right. That might surprise you. They're right. For, for one, the exclusive claims of Christianity are just not compatible with the non-Christian worldview. So it just, they can't mesh. So already that creates a conflict right there to begin with. Okay. But also, on a larger scale, maybe in a broader scale, religion, generally speaking, does tend to create a slippery slope in the heart for the feeling of superiority over others who just don't have the truth. That can happen. Doesn't mean that it's always going to happen, and it's not saying that that should happen. It shouldn't. But religion, in and of itself, can create that environment. It's easy for one religious group to stereotype and even, for that matter, to misrepresent another one. Once that situation exists, it easily spirals down into the marginalization of others or even active oppression and abuse and, for that matter, violence against them. And we've seen that throughout history, even in Christianity. Um, and, and even today in radical groups and cults and fringe movements like ISIS, we've seen that. Problem is, here's the problem with this, is who and how would you police that? Especially given that not all, and I'd even suggest most religions, um, are, are not peace destroyers. In fact, most would tend to, I'm talking religion as a whole, not Christianity, but religions as a whole are those who are tending toward peace. But you do have those few elements that do end up becoming problems. They're the, they're the cousins that nobody talks about, wants to talk about. So what do we do with that then, if that's the truth? By the way, if you tell somebody who is pushing back on some of those arguments with you and you say, yeah, by the way, I agree with you, that really shocks them off often. But then, but then, uh, but that's the truth. Because yeah, we always want to be honest. We always want to have the truth laid out. And so we don't want to be embellishing even ourselves and shining ourselves up so that we look like we're better than we are. So religion as a whole, we have some challenges. So what do we do with that? Well, some believe that it would be best if we just outlaw religion. Get rid of it. If nobody's allowed to have any religion, uh, just imagine, we could even write a song how, you know, if there was no religion in the world. Um, I think John Lennon beat me to that one, but um, no, I will not sing it for you. Uh, so, but it does, if you outlawed it, it would not work. History has shown us that. You only have to look at the massive efforts put forth by governments like Soviet Russia, uh, Communist China, North Korea today, uh, the Kumar Rouge, um, North Korea, uh, and, and Nazi Germany. All of them determined to tightly control religious practice in, in an effort to stop it from dividing society or eroding the power of the state. The result, however, was not more peace and harmony, interestingly enough, but was more oppression. In his book, The Twilight of Atheism, The Rise and Fall of Disbelief in the Modern World, Alistair McGrath said this about atheism in the 20th century. You can find it on page 230 of his book if you really want to look it up. And he said this, The 20th century gave rise to one of the greatest and most distressing paradoxes of human history, that the greatest intolerance and violence of that century were practiced by those who believed that religion caused intolerance and violence. Interesting, isn't it? Obviously, outlawing it, it's not going to work. 
even trying to legislate it through the government through government control also creates a slippery slope as we can probably even see in our own world today uh, there's a lot more I could say about that but it gives you a little taste moving on to the next one uh, exclusivity is unenlightened the sentiment in the media is that Christianity is unenlightened and outrageous to make exclusive religious claims that's just the sense you get out there and even in personal conversations I've had with people you'll find that often they they just can't understand how we can make such exclusive claims after all some of the sentiment is out there that that's disrespecting other wonderful teachings of other faiths I mean isn't that being arrogant to say that I mean after all aren't they as sincere as we are years ago there was an interview done some of you may have seen it on television between Oprah Winfrey and Tom Cruise and they were talking about uh, Tom Cruise is involved with this uh, organization called Scientology and Oprah was clearly skeptical of Cruz's religious beliefs, but then she asked the million dollar question. She said this to him, you don't believe Scientology is the only true religion, do you? <laughs> I mean, it was easy to tell that that question was loaded with a mountain of implications and, and you answer it wrong and the floodgates are going to be open. So Cruz answers in the way, of course, that answered the question as Oprah would have expected. And, he denied Scientology claimed to be the only religion. Apparently, uh, only us evangelical Christians are, are foolish enough to do that. But after clarifying this, you could sense immediately the tensions in the room were immediately lessened. The driving thought is that we should come to the enlightened understanding that all major religions are equal and basically teach the same thing, such as love and do good and become a better person. That's kind of where it's left at. And they must be respected because of their sincerity. Again, that sounds great and harmonious, but I have to tell you something. It's not possible. A chief problem with that idea is that the major religions are much too different to be considered the same to begin with. Christianity believes in a personal, interested God who's revealed himself through his word. Well, Hinduism has, as an example, has millions of gods. I don't know if you realize this, but uh, I didn't count them, but somebody told me that there's uh, at least 350 million different gods within the Hindu religion. They'll even pray to Jesus until they discover that Jesus has claimed to be exclusive, and then they have a problem with that. They also believe in an impersonal essence of a creator God who is beyond comprehension where we, as disciples of Jesus Christ, believe in a God who has revealed himself and is interested in our every day lives Hinduism also believes in many gods incarnating themselves on earth while Christianity claims that only Jesus became a man now here's the thing both are sincere but both can't be right both could be wrong but both couldn't be right now Islam teaches that Jesus was not God and simply a man he was a good man within uh, uh, Islamic teaching and even a prophet but only a man nonetheless and that he was never crucified whereas we believe that Jesus, Jesus is deity that Jesus is God came in the flesh crucified on the cross died and rose again Islam again teaches that there's one God named Allah absolutely denying the Trinity well one of Christianity's most basic important doctrines is the Trinity of God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit Again, both are absolutely sincere. Both could be wrong, but not both could be right. You with me so far? Okay. At the end of the day, the, the, the issue is not about our emotions. It's not about our preferences. For that matter, it's not even about sincerity. The issue comes down to truth. If we can agree on that, forget about whether Christianity is correct, Islam is correct, Judaism is correct, Hinduism is correct, Buddhism is correct. Forget that for now. But if we can come to a place where we agree that there is truth, and we got to start there, discovering where the truth is, I think that's an important step. 
I mean, after all, sincerity in religious matters is never enough. We do not need to doubt, by the way, the sincerity of those who follow Islam or Hinduism or Judaism or any multitude of other religions. In fact, we must, I, I think, and I personally do admire them for their dedication to what they believe, but sincerity only matters when it's applied to the proper object every single time. I mean, you can be sincerely wrong and you will still be wrong. You can sincerely drink rat poison and you'll be sincerely dead. <laughs> sincerely believe in the wrong thing doesn't make it right and it is not enlightened thinking. Fair enough? Okay. What's the third one? No one can see the whole truth. Maybe you've had that before. Well, you can't see the whole truth. Come on. How do you, what makes you feel that you are the one who is the arbitrator of all truth? Now, since we're in a series called The Elephant in the Room, I think we should use an argument that's often presented as the mic drop argument, usually with some of my friends in the past from the perspective of the skeptic, where they say this, each religion sees a part of spiritual truth, but none can see the whole truth. Okay? Maybe you've heard that one before. Everybody can see a part, but you can't see the whole. Now, the point is often present, presented with the story of a group of blind men who have never come across an elephant before. I think, wait, there we go. So there they are, a bunch of blind guys out in the jungle. They've never come across an elephant before, and I don't know how they get on top of the elephants and all these other places, but somehow they get up there, and they learn and conceptualize what the elephant is like by touching it. Now, each blind guy feels a different part of the elephant, uh, but only one part, such as, an example, the tusk, or maybe the trunk, or the leg, or the side, or, or the ears. And then they describe the elephant based on their partial experience, and their descriptions are in complete disagreement, of course, of what an elephant is. So, if, uh, you know, the guy feels a trunk. He says, oh, of course, an elephant, that's a snake. And uh, someone goes, what are you talking about? As he's feeling its leg, he goes, the elephant is like a tree. And the other guy who's up on, hanging on the ear, he says, listen, what are you talking about? It's, it's like a giant butterfly. I mean, you get the idea. And they could go on and on with different other thoughts about what the elephant looks like. Now, the moral of the parable here is that humans have a tendency to project their partial experiences as the whole truth, ignoring other people's partial experiences. And so, as a result, one, no one should ever consider that they, uh, everybody rather should consider that they could be partially right and um, just have some partial information and so as a result then uh, we can never have the full truth and then we must accept everybody else as just their truth i mean it's argued that each religion of the world then when you take it on the scale of religions have uh, a grasp a part of the truth about spirituality but nobody can see the whole elephant or claim to have a comprehensive vision of the truth really is kind of how it's summed up so what do you do with that maybe some of you have been in an argument and it's kind of like oh that sounds really good I think and I think that's a good argument but I throw in an however however this argument backfires on those who use it here's why the story is told from the point of view of somebody who isn't blind how could you know that each blind man sees part of the elephant unless you claim to be able to see the whole elephant? Makes sense. Now here's my point. How could you possibly know that no religion can see the whole truth unless you yourself have the superior comprehensive knowledge of spirituality that you just claim none of the religions have to even be able to say that? So what makes you right and me wrong? You just said nobody can see the whole picture, and yet somehow you're claiming that you see the whole picture to be able to tell that nobody can see the whole picture. Christian, here, here's why I believe that Christianity has a corner on the market here. The difference is this, that no other religion that I know of, all other religions seem to agree with, yes, everybody has a different way and a different understanding, and we all come to the same place eventually except for conservative Christianity. What I would suggest would be biblical Christianity, and I'll go through some of that in a minute, because Christianity claims that somebody who is not blind and somebody who saw the whole picture actually came by and told us. Now, if that's actually true, 
then it isn't arrogant to say that I was told the truth and that I have a handle on the truth. Now, we'll get to that a little bit later. Make sense so far? Okay, you still with me? Good. Last argument is the fourth one here. Moral arguments are a product of environment. Here's what that means. And again, I mean, it can come in a variety of different ways. This argument goes something like, I am more likely to be a Christian if I live in North America because of the cultural environment I've been presented with or brought up in. As opposed to, I would be more likely a Muslim if I was born in Iran because of that cultural argument or environment. Now, maybe you've heard that before. You're only a Christian because you happen to be born in a Christian family. You were born in a Christian country. That's the only reason. Somebody born in, in, in uh, uh, Afghanistan or, uh, for that matter, maybe up even in uh, Norway, uh, in Norway, maybe they, uh, they worship Odin. I don't know. Um, but th because of your cultural situation, as the argument goes, no one should claim that they know the truth since religious belief is too culturally and historically conditioned to be known for sure. Okay, so what do you do with that? Here's what I would suggest. I actually concede on a portion of this point. And here's why. I, we, we like to think that we think for ourselves, but it's really not that simple, folks. We think like the people we most admire. I mean, you've heard this before, birds of a feather flock together. Um, you've heard the saying, hell's angels bikers hang out with hell's angels bikers. Maybe not, I have heard that one, but, but they do. <laughs> These biker guys, they're not going to hang out with a group of pastors, generally speaking, unless one's dead, possibly at a funeral. I mean, everybody belongs to a community that reinforces the plausibility of some beliefs and discourages others. Okay, so I've conceded that, yes. However, I do have a, another however. However, to go on to say that because we're all locked into historical and cultural locations, we can't therefore judge the rightness and wrongness of competing beliefs is not a plausible argument and conclusion. Just isn't, and here's why. I mean, what, what this argument, this moral arguments or product of environment is really doing is making a claim that there is no absolute truth. Let's start there first, and then I'll unpack that a bit. This is a philosophy, by the way, and, and I'm using this word because it will probably come out in some of your conversations, and just be aware of it. It's, it's a, a philosophy called absolute relativism. Anybody have heard that philosophy before? So some of you have. Absolute relativism is really just a neat way of saying that there is no absolute truth. In other words, truth isn't really truth. You can't have truth fully. The only truth you can have within this type of situation is, is the truth that a particular individual or culture happened to believe for themselves. And because of that, I can never impose it on somebody else. So something like uh, uh, if I'm part of a pygmy tribe in the middle of Africa and we only wear loincloths, that's our truth, we understand that, but I should not come in as a, as a Canadian missionary or a Canadian uh, ambassador and impose the fact that they've got to wear parkas because that's our truth. Okay. That's a different thing, but that's kind of an example of what po some people possibly would think. Here's the thing, though, however. Absolute relativism can only exist if the individual making the claim takes themselves out or exempts themselves from that, their own standard of judgment. Here's why. If you believe that we are products of our historical and cultural environment, and so then conclude that no belief can be held as universally true for everyone, that comment right there is in itself a comprehensive claim about everyone. That is the product of your own environment and social conditions, because you had to come up with that conclusion somewhere. University, maybe uh, you are raised in North America. So, in other words, that claim can't be true on its own. I mean, I'll unpack it a little bit more. I hope you just stay with me for a moment. You might have heard it expressed, well, that's your truth, but it's not mine. However, it's a fact that truth is universal. I mean, gravity is as true here in Dartmouth as it is in Cambodia. Did you know that? Years ago, we all learned now, correct me if I'm wrong, any teachers in this room? Raise your hand if you're a teacher or a former teacher. Or just a picky parent. Okay. Um, we all learned when we were children that 2 plus 2 equals 
I didn't hear three. I didn't hear five in there. We knew it was four. And guess what? That is a universal truth here as well as in Soviet Russia. That's a universal truth. We may have different opinions about something, but truth, though narrow, is still truth. Yes, our cultural biases make weighing and competing truth claims harder. The social conditioning of belief is a fact, but it can't be used to argue that all truth is completely relative or else the very argument refutes itself. You can't say, now here's what I'm going to unpack this a little bit more. You can't say all claims about religions are historically conditioned except for the one that I'm just making right now. You can't do that. If you insist that no one can determine which beliefs are right or, beliefs are right or wrong, why should we believe what you're saying then? Why? The reality is at the end of the day that we all make truth claims of some sort and it's very hard to weigh them responsibly, but we have no alternative but to try to do so. So back to the question then. Do all religions lead to God? Yes, I know it's only a short little package here and we could talk about a lot more, but based on the fact that truth is narrow and based on the fact that the competing religious belief systems are just too different, and based on some of these other arguments that I shared, I think we could safely say, and I would come to the conclusion that no, they don't all lead to God. So then why do I believe that Christianity does? Well, I believe Christianity does because of what Jesus said. Now, two things to address right here, right now, I'm going to lay it on the table. One is about the historicity of Jesus, and the other is about the accuracy of the Bible. I bring it up here because we don't have time to go into those two important topics, especially given that, now, that we're now going to be seeing what Jesus had to say about the matter. If Jesus was, isn't who he claimed to be, then what we say really doesn't matter. And if the Bible is truly a man-made collection of contradictory literature, then that doesn't add any weight to my arguments either. However, two of the upcoming apologetic discussions are going to be speaking directly to the issue of whether or not the Bible is full of contradictions and also who Jesus is. So stick around and I'll address it then, understanding that we're building on one after another. Not only that, but we also just recently did a sermon on uh, Jesus and deity of Jesus and, and, and uh, looked at the arguments of, of uh, specifically more about Jesus um, uh, just coming out of mythology and out of the old fertility, uh, being borrowed from fertility gods. Go online, you can check out that sermon. You can also check out my blog, The Savage Theologian, and I have some, some things that I say about that there too. There's other resources. If you're interested, come and talk to me, and I'd love to give those to you as well. But trust me when I say that I'm not a blind follower because I've done some research and I will we'll be uh, approaching this from the perspective of the reality of Jesus as well as the historicity and accuracy of the Bible. I've actually done some research, by the way, and haven't begun my faith journey with a false hope or belief in fairy tales. So what I'm asking you to do, and my hope is, is that you'll just trust me enough to journey a few miles with me. Just trust me enough. So now let's get to what Jesus said. So we addressed some of the cultural issues very quickly, I know, but what did Jesus have to say? And you know what? We're also going to be understanding a little bit of what Jesus said quickly too. In John 14, verses 1 to 6, if you have your Bibles, you can certainly turn there. I'll have it on the screen as well, but, but you can also follow and make sure that I'm reading it correctly. Jesus said this in John 14, starting in verse 1, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, would I have told you uh, that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How, how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, well, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So what was going on here? Jesus had just informed his disciples that he was going away. He had spent now three years with them, going through the good, the bad, and the ugly. And he's telling them that he's going away and he's going to prepare a place for them through his uh, death, resurrection, and ascension. And at that time, they didn't really understand what that meant about his death. And they're thinking, my goodness, you can't leave now. We're just getting going. But he assures his men that they know where he's going. But Thomas objects. You've heard doubting Thomas. Thomas, I don't know if he's so much a doubter all the time. Um, 
He was the guy who, when Jesus came in and met the disciples after he'd risen from the dead, Thomas wasn't there. I don't know if he was out getting a jug of milk or something. I don't know what he was doing. But uh, he came back later on, and, and, he, and the disciples told him about Jesus. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe it till I can see him and touch him. Um, I think that just was indicative of the love that he had for Jesus as though he wanted to make sure he wanted to hug his Savior. But he's known as Doubting Thomas anyways, and so this same guy. And here he is, throwing out another question. He goes, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? Jesus declares, then at that point, the mother of all politically incorrect statements. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, if words mean anything, this is an utterly exclusive claim. Add that to the words of Peter in Acts 4.12. Salvation is found <clears throat> in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Then you have the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Finally, consider 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So John 14 and these other three verses seem to be absolutely definitive then. Very exclusive. There's no other way. There's no other name. There's no other foundation. And there's no other mediator. Listen, if it's narrow-minded and intolerant to claim that Jesus, and as a consequence Christianity, is the only way to God, then Jesus himself must have been narrow-minded and intolerant. Because it's exactly what he claimed about himself. But when you read the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you read all four, any of the four, you don't encounter an, an intolerant, arrogant man. Rather, you see a man full of grace and compassion toward others. People, even who are not disciples of Jesus, love Jesus. Oprah Winfrey loves Jesus. I don't know if that's a great thing to claim, but, but she does. The world loves Jesus because they see him as tolerant and as a man full of love. But if they actually discovered what Jesus said, hmm, like the Hindus who will worship idols of Jesus till they discover that he says that he is the only way, then something changes. So we see this about Jesus, and, and he is, and, and, and by the way, Jesus is full of grace, and he is full of compassion, and yet at the same time, the God of the Bible is clearly an utterly exclusive God. And when his son declares, no one comes to the Father except through me, he means it. Okay? So what do we do with that? Well, Peter says that we need to prepare. So how do we prepare? Peter gave us great advice. He, always, he told us to always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks. So uh, I think that begs the question, how do we prepare then? I think part of it is doing a little bit of homework to know that we understand a little bit about the culture around us. But I think there is a fundamental answer. And I think the starting point is this, is don't be afraid. Because I think too often fear um, makes us defensive about our faith and uncertain about even talking to others. So don't be afraid of anyone who doesn't share your point of view. That's okay. What I would suggest is you build relationships with people. Learn even how to listen to them. Learn how to have an honest dialogue with people. And if that means that, you know what, you've been in situations where you've been having some issues with a family member, because usually it's family members where we kind of let our guards down a little bit. Sometimes just, you know what, let them talk. Let them talk. But in the meantime, here's what we need to be doing. Get grounded in God's word. Make sure you know what you believe. Make sure that you begin to get to know Jesus. When Jesus is living in and through us, people will notice. It's Jesus that we want them attracted to, not all your knowledge. In fact, if anything, often if you know a lot, that's repulsive to our family and friends especially. You know it all, right? But if you are like Jesus, where you're gentle, and where you're full of grace, where you're full of compassion, guess what? People are attracted to that. But take up that word, and don't just read it. Study it. Memorize it. 
Find out what it teaches. Learn the doctrines of our faith. Let the word of God be the firm foundation for your own life and also for your family. Make Jesus, uh, allow Jesus' heartbeat to become your heartbeat. Many followers of other religions know more about what they believe than what we know about what we believe often as Christians. And I don't fault them for that. In fact, I think it's high time that we learn as much about Christianity as a Muslim does about Islam. But as you get to know God, allow Jesus to live in and through you. It's not about your story that needs to be made known. It's about Jesus' story. When we talk about Jesus being made famous in Halifax and Dartmouth and Nova Scotia, keep reminding yourself about the fact that it's not to make Steve famous. It's not to make you famous. It's to make Jesus famous. So let him be the hero of the story. We also need to be aware. Let's be people who are aware of what's going on around us. Don't stick our heads in the sand. Don't, don't sit in our ivory towers of church life and church groups. No matter what critics might think about the demise of religion church, truth is people's interest in religion is really on the rise globally. There's this renewed spiritual hunger. That's why Islam is on the rise. That's why New Age, uh, uh, why people are turning to New Age. That's why Eastern religions attract so many people. The incredible religious diversity, I think, testifies to the hunger that's inside everybody's heart. We're, we're made to know God, and if we don't fill the God-shaped vacuum with the truth, we'll fill it with whatever substitute we can find. And it could be any other kind of religion, or it could be some other idol in our lives. Yeah, I know that it seems like there's a spiritual darkness everywhere in our culture today, but the very fact that we live in spiritual darkness means that when the light shines, when Jesus shines through us, it really shines. So let's not be discouraged by the difficulty of the task. Instead, be encouraged by the opportunities. Then we need to be gentle as well. Kind of made an allusion to that a little bit. It's right at this point that I think many of us fail. I know I've had that experience where we fail. We get the bold part right, um, but then we get mad when somebody disagrees with us and the joy of the Lord is replaced with the wrath of God. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> no wonder some people just don't want to talk to us. But listen, if people get angry at you, I'm not saying that they all will, but some might. Let it be because of the truth you speak, not because of our angry words. If somebody rejects Jesus, let it be because they truly reject him and not because we lost our temper. I mean, always remember, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You can never swear somebody into the kingdom. Trust me, it won't work. It's my early days, by the way. The Apostle Paul offers some very specific advice. And he says this in 2 Timothy, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, which, by the way, includes your brother, <laughs> for some of you, or your sister, or your parents. Be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his appointments with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. You know, Paul's advice is simple, but it's not always easy to follow. So don't let your family member get you so riled up that you lose your cool, blow your top, say things you shouldn't say. Keep your cool. It, I mean, it's quite possible to argue them away from the kingdom, but you can never argue them into it. It's not possible for us to convince somebody that what we're saying is true anyways. That's because salvation is a miracle of God. It's the, it's the Holy Spirit that is working on the human heart. And only the Holy Spirit can convert the soul. It's not up to us. It's up to Jesus. It's not our arguments that transform hearts and ways of thinking. Our job is to represent Jesus to them and then giving it to the Holy Spirit to work through them. Therefore, be gentle under pressure and kind even when pushed to the limit. There's no quota that we have to fill. Allow the Holy Spirit to work. We must be patient toward those who oppose us, but we must with humility at the same time tell them the truth, which leads us to this last point, be bold. If Jesus is truly the only way, some people think that we're arrogant and we're bigoted, but let me tell you, that is the most loving thing we can do is to share it with others if he truly is the only way. Let's suppose that you and I are standing 50 feet away from the edge of a cliff, okay? 
If, if you fall off, you're, you're going to drop 1,800 feet before you hit the jagged rocks at the, on the bottom of the canyon floor. There's no guardrails. This guy's just standing there looking down, nothing there to hold somebody from falling over. As you and I are standing there chatting, we're having a great time talking about things, we see this old man walking towards the edge. And uh, as he nears the edge, we realize all of a sudden that he's blind. And uh, he has no idea of the danger he's in. Now, we should have moved probably before he said anything, but as he gets near, he shouts out to us. He goes, which way should I go? <laughs> what would you think if I yelled, it doesn't matter, go any way you like? Probably not a good idea. I mean, in fact, I, would, I think I'd be criminally negligent if, if he fell to his death. So, but if I care for him at all, I'll call out, don't take another step. I'll come and get you. And I'll walk over to him. I'll take him by the arm. and I'll lead him away from the edge of the cliff and lead him to safety. You see, love compels me to speak the truth and to do what I can to save his life. Do all religions lead to God? No. Does that mean that Christians are narrow-minded? Yes, we are. Because all truth is narrow, and Jesus, who is the truth, said, and as I read this, the worship team can come back up, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Listen, if you want to find your way to God, you have to travel the course that Jesus laid out. Other roads might look attractive. They, it might even look like the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. It might even seem like there's shortcuts to God. But there is only one road that leads to God, and it is through Jesus and the Holy Spirit then transforming our lives. So as we journey into the future and as we connect with others who are beginning to ask the question about the hope that it is that is within us. We point them to Jesus. We leave the results with the Holy Spirit because it is impossible for us to be able to convince anybody any other way. But the Lord still will allow us to learn and to grow, but ultimately the results are His. And we can rest assured knowing that Jesus always will receive the glory. Jesus is always the only way.